You're listening to the Business Brain Food Podcast. Welcome to the Business Brain Food Podcast, the show business owners listen to when they want to take their business to the next level. Head to businessbrainfood.com.au to catch up on past episodes and access show notes from every episode. Now, here's your host, Ben Futrell. Well, welcome back to the Business Brain Food Podcast. This, my friend, is the podcast that is 100% devoted to taking you and your business to the next level. And the good news is, doesn't matter whether you're just brand new to this business thing, so maybe just scratching that entrepreneurial itch, or maybe you're like myself and you've been in business for a long, long time and you've got the scars and the wounds to prove it. No matter what, there's always something new we can do to take our business to the next level. And today is absolutely no different. Very shortly, I'm going to be joined by Amber Renee, and we're going to hear about her entrepreneurial journey from going from civil engineer all the way through to... Uh, three six-figure businesses that she's built. So we'll get there very, very shortly. Before we get Amber onto the show, I wanted to remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Max My Profit. And the team at Max My Profit help you build the business that you imagine. Now, they're giving away a $17,000 business coaching program. That's right, a $17,000 business coaching program. Head across to winbusinesscoaching.com.au forward slash BBF to find out more about how to enter that competition. Alrighty, uh, so Amber Renee, as I mentioned there, is a civil engineer, serial entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and digital nomad. Amber Renee inspires women to rediscover their wow factor through presentation, personal branding, e-courses, and building funnels. Not only is she an icon for style, but she's also an icon for women's empowerment through her phenomenal entrepreneurial success story, having built three six-figure businesses in arguably the toughest industries. She's passionate about sharing her advice, wisdom, and experiences to her peers and the 70,000 strong global community. Welcome to the Business Brain Food Podcast, Amber. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. I'm excited to share some knowledge with your audience today. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure. Now, I've got to start at the civil engineer because, you know, I did read somewhere that you painted your steel cap boots pink. Is this true? <laughs> You've done your research. Yeah, absolutely. So I was always very passionate about fashion, obviously, back in the day. And uh, working on a construction site is not particularly fashionable or glamorous. So I did what I could just to make it a little bit more fun. And yeah, I got the pink surveyor's paint and used to roll around a construction site with hot pink boots and a, and a steel cap, uh, steel, steel cap hot pink boots. So it was always about the fashion, wasn't it? <laughs> We've got protection, but it's got to be fashionable. <laughs> so tell us, how did you go from being civil engineer? Or, or, well, let's start there. What, what led you down that journey, that career path? Yeah, I guess I was just always really good at maths and science. It's very effortless to me. Uh, always, you know, really great at it at school. And my dad is an engineer and my older brother is an engineer. So it just kind of made sense for me to study engineering. There was no real thought process behind it. Um, I loved working as an engineer. I used to work on a construction site in Brisbane and I built a few roads and bridges. And whilst I loved that job, I could tell that I was never going to be super passionate about it. Mm. You know, I didn't, wasn't excited about the industry, didn't want to become an old engineer. Like I looked at the people who were above me and didn't want to become one of those sort of people. So realized that I should probably quit and follow my passion, which is what I eventually did not long after graduating. Yeah. Okay. And so tell us about that next step. So you quit civil engineering and what was your, what was your first business? What did you, what did you go into first? Well, my first business was a fashion label. So I started with me on a sewing machine. I made four shirts the first week. We took them to the cool boutique and they bought four shirts. The next week I made eight shirts and they bought eight shirts. And then five years later, I had 120 accounts around Australia. Uh, we exported to Paris, Tokyo, LA and South Africa. We dressed some of the biggest celebrities in the world, which back in the day was Paris Hilton. So we were doing influencer marketing before it was even a thing. Before it was trendy. <laughs> We were doing it and, um, and yeah, and then I, I, I did runway parades all around the world. So it started off uh, pretty small, but ended up pretty, pretty substantial as far as a, um, a global business goes. Yeah. Uh, and what ignited the spark inside of you to start that business? I mean, instead of the sewing machine to make four, four, four garments and then sell them, what, what, what got you started? It was pure passion, Ben. I just loved it. You know, I'd quit my engineering job. Um, my mentor in engineering has previously told me uh, that I used to stand on a construction site sketching dresses. So she would come and see me and I'd have my plans in my hand of the road mm. and on the back of the plans I'd be sketching dresses. And I don't remember this, but this is what she's told me in, in recent years. So it was just always something I was passionate about. I used to make clothes at school, at, like in year five and six. I used to make my friends clothes and sell them. That was probably my first business. Uh, and it was just always something that I was always super passionate about. So um, 
you know, there was never any real intention of I'm going to start a business. It was just like, oh, well, I've got a bit of spare time on my hands and I know how to sew and I love it. So how about I, you know, make a few shirts and see how it goes. And it just kind of stumbled, you know, I was following my passion, doing something that really lit me up and it just sort of grew into this massive thing. Yeah, wow. Now, and so would you say it was quite accidental, the growth that you had then? Because, it, you know, in some ways it looks like you quite purposely, you know, did what you did to get exposure because you've been quite involved with the media or a designer on Project Runway. Uh, you know, you've had celebrities wearing your garments. You've been on radio shows, TV shows. Um, has that played a big part in your success? And was that a deliberate thing? Did you go, I'm going to do this because it will get me exposure? Or did people come to you and go, look, we love your passion. Can you be part of our our, our, our show? It started off uh, that people were approaching us. You know, we were in Brisbane. We, there wasn't a lot of fashion labels at the time operating out of Brisbane. Mm. So I just sort of got made friends with the local press because they were at the runway shows that I was at. And so we just sort of you know, became friendly. And that's how I kind of stumbled into the whole publicity game because I ended up becoming, you know, sort of the go-to person in Brisbane just because there really wasn't a lot of other people at the time. Like we were talking 15, 20 years ago kind of thing. So that's how I realized that, you know, the media is just another person that you can reach out to that is trying to fill a page in a magazine or is trying to get something interesting to talk about that day. So that was sort of how my media, um, uh, relationship started and absolutely I've gone on to really understand and, and now actually teach how to get publicity because it's just so incredibly valuable um, for any business no matter what business you're in. Yeah and so that was your first business so what so when you went from that uh, you know just sewing at home to actually realizing that you had a business at what point did you realize geez I've got something more here I've got something bigger? Gosh I wouldn't know Ben that's a great question I don't know that it was ever very intentional mm. um and I've certainly and it, it was back in the day where if you were a business owner it was um it was frowned upon it was like oh you can't get a job oh that's a shame you have to run a business and you were a small business owner there was never this big thing of like entrepreneurship and hashtag hustle that was it was never trendy back then so I guess it was never really like, oh, look at me, I'm running a business. It was just kind of always something that I just sort of woke up and did every day, um, you know, and just to try and get some money in the door and to pay the bills. Like there was never any big like, I'm an entrepreneur now, whereas uh, I think that's what, you know, is so trendy these days. Yeah, you know, I think people are, um, it's definitely a buzzword and I think people are, are deliberately now going out and, and, and being entrepreneurs. And I think it's, it's, I think it's an overused term these days, to be honest with you. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the, the people that are, you know, I mean, I don't want to bag Instagram influencers because I am one, but, you know, there's a lot of people online that are, you know, not really actually working in a business or even actually making any money. And they're like, I'm an entrepreneur. And you're like, well, are you though? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and this is a thing like, I mean, you have got a good following on Instagram. I think you've got over 50,000 followers on Instagram and we'll talk about that shortly. And, 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 in, and this influencer marketing is a conversation that keeps coming up on these podcasts now that five years ago when I started this podcast, no one really talked about. So, you know, I had Emma Lovell on last week who uh, is from Cozy Go. She makes these little capsules for babies on planes and in strollers. Um, and she's used influencer marketing as one of her main strategies to grow her business. So it's it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, more and more of you are talking about using this as a strategy. I mean, yourself, are you approached a lot for from companies to promote their goods and services? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I would get probably two or three emails a day from yeah. people to reach out to my audience. And it is. It's so incredibly effective. I mean, I've been personally doing influencer marketing since about, 2014. So I've had long-term relationships with brands like um, Renault and Vesper and LG, like major international companies. And I've sold cars off the back of promoting, you know, the cars on my following. So it's incredibly effective. And also I believe it's a way of the future. And that's actually why I've recently, as at the time of speaking, I've literally just launched an influencer marketing e-course, which teaches people how to do influencer marketing. Oh, well, that's so, handy to know. We'll, we'll, find, <laughs> we'll have to get it. We'll get a link to, of that uh, about that off you uh, before we go, because I think people would love to to find out more about that. But I've, I've got to ask you this: as an influencer mask marketer, how mm -hmm. do you decide whose products you will and won't promote? Like, obviously, there's got to be some alignment and integrity in, in what you promote; otherwise, it wouldn't work. But you must get some real duds come to you. So, how, how do you decide what to promote? Yeah, great question. I guess because I'm super concerned with my brand, I'm very protective of my own brand and also really love my audience. 
So I wouldn't be promoting something that they wouldn't love, you know, like I'm very concerned about mm. is something that they would want to hear about um, because obviously the reason that I'm able to earn money off the audience is because of them. So I'm super uh, uh, aware of, um, you know, is this something that they would want to hear about? And if it is, I'd be happy to share it with them. And, and I guess a, a good um, way of judging that is it, would you share it with your bestie? You know, would you ring up your bestie and go, hey, babe, I've just discovered this new product or I'm doing this and I'm loving it. You should do it. And that's sort of the rule of thumb that I like to use when considering who to work with. Yeah. So tell us about some of the other business ventures that you've started then. So you've had three six-figure businesses in uh, in difficult industries. So obviously your first thing was fashion and, mm-hmm. and you've spoken about your e-courses. What other businesses have you got up and running? So my second, so the first business was a product-based business, obviously, mm-hmm. and then the second business was a service-based business. So that was a fashion styling business, which is sort of like a one-on-one consulting uh, job. So um, I would work one-on-one with clients and and you know sort of run a service-based business that way. And again, I rose to that industry. I rose to the top of that industry really quickly. So I started. Um, in, I just moved to Melbourne. I had no contacts, no networks, had never done the job before and found myself out of work. I couldn't get a job. I literally, uh, could not, you know, tried to go back to getting a day job after having a fashion label and I just couldn't get work. So I decided again, sort of, you know, following my passion. Oh, well, I'm very passionate about helping women look and feel better. So why don't I just, um, you know, try and make a business out of that or just try and pay the bills out of that. And so again, I sort of stumbled into this industry and into this business, which I then rose to the ranks of very quickly. So I was the fashion editor for women's health and fitness and the resident stylist at Southern Cross Stereo, which um, back in the day was our biggest radio and TV mm. network. So I had two of the biggest residency gigs in the country after about three or four years in the industry. And most people would never have anything like that, you know, even after 20 years in the industry. So um, again, I sort of accredit that to my uh, personal brand. I'm really strong again with um, personal branding. I worked with a lot of celebrities, which again, back in the day, sort of no one was doing. Um, and and again, it's sort of touching on that influencer marketing kind of thing. So I was very good with letting the media know what I was up to and letting my audience know what I was up to, which sort of helped me rise through the ranks a bit quicker. Yeah, and and I think that's so. Um, it's important for people to understand, isn't it? Because it is about you personally. If you're going to use that as a marketing tool, uh, right. yourself as a marketing tool, your personal brand has to be really strong. Otherwise, you're not going to get those opportunities. What what made you go from product based to service based? Because you'd had all that experience with selling into many countries with uh, with your fashion label. What made you decide that you know that, that you weren't just going to expand with more products? So that label actually went bankrupt. We uh, had our biggest season yet and we borrowed all this money from the bank Mm -hmm. to um, service this collection and our manufacturer in Vietnam went out of business with all of our money, all of our stock, all of our patterns and the entire collection. So we basically went bankrupt. I went from having a, you know, this um, multi-national business to no business really quickly. And was it the fact that that happened that that you went, I don't want to go back into product manufacturing, it's too hard? Or was it the capital that was required to restart that? Or what made you decide not to go back into product? Oh, I would never do products ever again. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, I would never um, manufacture and sell the way that we were doing it. That model is a broken model. The cash flow is too difficult because Mm. you're paying – for uh, goods up front that you don't get your money back for six months. So it's just too hard to keep that cash flow sort of balance. So I just don't think that um, that particular manufacturing style is a smart business model. Mm. So, let, so let's talk about that for a second because I think a lot of people, a lessons, I don't know if you know of Jim Rowan, you know, a very famous entrepreneur and motivational speaker, and he says we can learn more from the, you know, the person that's failed than those that have succeeded. You know, when, you, when you go through that process, what would you have done differently to avoid that from happening, uh, you know, for the, the business from suffering in that way? Yeah, I mean, I guess it was cash flow, and and that's probably the number one issue that all um, business owners have mm. is managing your funds. I was very bad at managing money, and really had no desire to manage the money. It was, wasn't something that I was interested in. Um, you know, I was the creative one. I just wanted to do that, um, and uh, and we were also always sort of you know always wanting to expand, and so we would always take on accounts that we shouldn't have taken on. So I guess it's coming down to saying no to clients that you shouldn't be working with. So we would, you know, 
give our product to shops that have a bad reputation for not paying designers or we would you know resell to someone that hadn't paid us or paid us late for the last collection so really we should have had better boundaries around like you have to pay us up front or you no know, you you haven't paid us last time so you never get to stock us ever again things like that um you know which which we had no boundaries around at all yeah, which, which and they're such good lessons, you know, such good lessons because when you're caught up in that whirlwind of growth, I think, uh, you know, so many people judge business owners based on their revenue, but it's not about revenue, is it? No, it's about cash flow and staying mm. afloat. Mm. So it's about profitability. So, you know, how do you, you know, how did that affect your mindset as an entrepreneur? You know, you did you did you feel like, oh, geez, I'm a failure. What am I going to do? Or did you just bounce back out of that and go, I'm just going to get on with something else? I uh, know. So I swore off entrepreneurship for life. I was never, ever going to start another job, mm. uh, another business ever. Um, I went a- completely away from the fashion industry. So I hated the fashion industry for a while and went and tried to get a day job um, and lasted about eight months in a corporate day job and th- until I got fired from that. Turns out I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely shocking employee. And then, so I got fired from that job and then I moved to Melbourne and was hired as a fashion designer to start a label for a manufacturing house. So they wanted to do an in-house label. So um, I launched, so it was, it was essentially the job that I was doing, but I was getting paid by someone a salary, which was awesome. So uh, that was great in that I started a business from scratch. I started a brand new label and within the first six months, we made $500,000 and got stock in David Jones, which was just unheard of. So it was a great opportunity but again I was a terrible employee and got fired from that job after about yeah about a year <laughs> <laughs> so we're quickly working out you're not you don't make a good employee so <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast yeah so many so many entrepreneurs are that way though they're not great employees but how did it change the way then that you managed your finances because obviously you're quite open about the fact that you weren't interested in managing the cash flow back in the day of the design label um, you know, and then going through those two jobs and now you're where you are, you, you know, obviously new heights of success. H- how has it changed the way that you manage your cash flow now? So unfortunately, Ben, for me, money has probably been one of the biggest issues that I've had to deal with in my entire life. I've mm. got very bad money blocks. Um, I'm constantly working on, you know, trying to sort out my finances and it just feels like it's a big struggle for me. So for me, you know, I can get on the on a billboard and on a TV show and on the cover of a magazine, no problem. But I just can't seem to. Um, for me personally, money has always been a big issue. So, and I find that at every level that I get to, it's um, a similar kind of. Um, you know, I, I say new level, old devil. So I'm constantly, you know, even now I'm, you know, earning six figures a month and I'm constantly working on, okay, what's the mindset around this? What am I not, you know, now I've got to deal with how I invest my money, and so. For me, money has just been a very, very big block in my life that I just find that I'm constantly working on. I'd love to give people advice on how to get over that, but I don't know that I'm the best person to to be giving advice on that. You're not there. I love that saying, new level, same devil. Yeah. Um, so, so do you have people around you? Have you got like professionals that you rely upon and lean on now to help you manage your money? Exactly, yeah. So I hire, mm. I've got a really great bookkeeper, a really great accountant and a really good CFO. So all of those people and then external advisors as well. So, yeah, I guess that's the luxury these days is that I'm actually able to afford people who I can rely on and who are able to give me solid advice um, around that, which is not something that, you know, I'd ever done in the past. Like back when we had the first, the fashion label, my mum was doing my books and she's got incredibly bad money blocks and really, um, you know, she's not great with money either. So it was just a disaster. <laughs> yes, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? But I, I mean, it does show, I, I think I think it's really important for people to understand that most entrepreneurs are not good at everything. And it's it can be quite deceiving when they see somebody like yourself and, you know, hosting TV shows and jumping on, you know, like I said, you've got mainstream spots and radio shows and you've had all this success. It doesn't mean that you're good at everything correct and not everyone is so Mm. again the takeaway there is is to understand where your strengths and weaknesses are and then to outsource your weaknesses and focus more on your strengths yeah so now you're teaching people how to launch and scale their own brands and businesses online what what's led you down that path again ben i feel like i sort of stumbled into this it was just sort of like a passion that I was interested in. I followed the passion and I just kind of ended up where I am. So I always think when people are going, I'm not sure what business I should start. I always just give the advice of 
what are you passionate about mm. and what what would you do whether you're getting paid or not go and do that and see if you can turn that into a business and these days you can basically turn anything into a business right so I, um, the way that this started, uh, again, I say the universe lovingly pushed me out of my uh, past, my previous business. So I was working as the fashion stylist. I had the two big residency gigs and I was smooth sailing, you know, like it was super mm. easy. To read. And the GFC had finally hit Australia. And in, in the course of about a month, I'd lost my two residency contracts. So I was out of work and I was back to being sort of like a freelance stylist which means that you're back to hustling for jobs and trying to find you know trying to find jobs and I just didn't have the passion for it you know I didn't have the passion for the hustle it just wasn't you know um, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about the shit sandwich and she talks about whether you're willing to eat the shit sandwich to get the result that that um, that that uh, provides so she's in, she talks about writing a book and how she's willing to eat the shit sandwich of sitting down and writing every day because she knows she wants to be an author well, I had lost the passion at that stage for fashion styling and I just wasn't willing to eat that shit sandwich anymore. Mm. So I was like, well, I'm done with it. Um, I had nothing left to offer except all of this knowledge. I knew so much about the industry. I'd reached the top of the game and I was really good at teaching. So I just sat down one day and shot an e-course without even thinking that it was a thing. So this was again back in probably... I think this was 2015 and e-courses weren't anything back then. Like no one was doing e-courses, you know, it wasn't really a career and I was just doing it because I, I had so much knowledge and I thought, well, you need to do something with this knowledge. You need to honor this, you know, the, the past four or five years that you've had. So I sat down, shot an e-course on my phone and then, you know, over the next 18 months, tried to figure out how to sell it. So it was just like a, a stumble into kind of thing again. I love this, <laughs> just stumbling into it. But you know what also, you're pointing out some really simplistic things that I think could be easily missed if I don't bring them up. You said you, said you shot your whole e-course on a phone um, and, and then you ne- you, the next 18 months you worked out how to, to sell it. But, you know, a lot of people would be, would be wanting to do an e-course or some sort of training because a lot of people that have knowledge, um, you know, know they can sell that knowledge but don't know how. Um, was there a reason you shot it on a phone? You just didn't worry about the quality of it? You thought that'll do? Just the information's more important? Yeah, absolutely. I shot it in my wardrobe, like in my... Like, in your wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a great, like with a backdrop, you know, like mm. it was so so basic and so simple. But, yes, it was the information that literally no one else knew. And I guess with fashion styling, it's the kind of industry where no one helps anyone else. It's highly competitive and highly secretive. So you would never be able to even access this kind of information. Like you couldn't even buy this information and there was, it wasn't available online. You couldn't find it anywhere. So yeah, it was very valuable. Yeah. And so in that next 18 months, um, working out how to, to then market it and sell it, what did you learn? Uh, I learned that if I pay someone for their knowledge, it saves me a lot of blood, sweat and tears. Mm. I learned. So I took 18 e-courses. over the next yeah about 18 months on how to how to create an e-course how to sell an e-course funnels facebook ads you know digital marketing copywriting all of those kind of things and just became a, a, a like a, a learner like a really passionate learner and i was so passionate about it because i'd finally found this industry that was part uh creative and part science like there's a real science to digital marketing there's a lot of data in facebook advertising and building funnels and all that, those kind of things And it kind of brought me back to my heritage as an engineer. So each day I would have to really use my brain. Like it was very difficult trying to figure out how to build a profitable funnel and how to hack a funnel and how to create Facebook ads and Mm. read all the data. And that part of my brain hadn't been used since I was an engineer. So for me to finally find a career where I was equally creative and equally data driven, you know, it really lit me up. I was super passionate about it and just really enjoyed the process. Yeah, interesting. You've sort of done a full circle, but the engineer, the, you're engineering something differently now. Are you? Have you always been a passionate learner? Like, have you always been reading books and consuming audio or anything like that throughout your entire life, or is this something that's new? No, I've always been a passionate learner. Yeah, always big in the self help, personal development, all of those kind of things. So I've, I've read basically every sort of book on that, and every book on money as well. Funnily enough, so all of the you know. Um, rich dad, poor dad, all of those kind of books as well. So, yeah, always pretty passionate about learning and educating myself. 
Yeah, and do you think that's a big part of your success? I mean, is the fact that you – I mean, I, I speak to so many entrepreneurs that – and I don't think I know any that don't read on a regular basis or listen to audio on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, is, is it something that you think anybody who's wanting to grow their business it, it needs to be filling their mind up with this stuff? I think it goes hand in hand. And I think it's more the personality type, right? Because if you're an entrepreneur, you're constantly solving a new problem and you're constantly mm. trying to figure out – what this next step is and how you're going to learn that and how you're going to grow your business. Cause it's, I mean, you're literally constantly growing every single day. So I guess if that is your personality type, then you'll make a great entrepreneur. So, you know, if you're already passionate about learning and knowledge and upskilling yourself, then you're probably going to be really good at running a business. Yeah. So, so what is it that motivates you? Is it, I mean, cause I mean, you said you're not, you're not great with managing the money side. I, I, I don't know whether money is what motivates you, but what is it that gets you out of bed every morning and, you know, lights that fire in your belly? For me, my biggest motivator is freedom. So I'm constantly mm. trying to find new freedom, which for me, it looks like an adventure. So I'm always trying to find the new adventure, trying to, you know, grow and expand in some way. Um, so that's kind of why I get up and do what I do each day, just so that I can, you know, try something new every single day. I get bored super easily. Um, so it, it has to be new and exciting. So how, how many hours a day are you putting in where, where you'd say you're working? Is it, are you like a nonstop person? I mean, I know a lot of people are like that, the hustle, hustle, hustle. I was for the first couple of years, my, my brand is set up in a way that I can do less and less. Mm. So you know, I'm able, my funnels are pretty operational, so they run themselves and I'm able, luckily enough to be able to employ people to do a lot of the hard work for me. These days, I just kind of like to do the strategy um, and really just, um, and, and any of the creation. So we've actually done a lot of, uh, I've created a couple of courses this year. So I've just finished building a funnels course. And as I mentioned, the Instagram course. So anything like that um, rather than the day-to-day -day operation of the business. Yeah. Now, just to put this into perspective, you said you're doing six figures per month from courses. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, we have had a couple of six-figure months uh, this year, yes. Yeah, wow. So that just gives people a real understanding that they're – and, and I, I, cause I, I try and tell a lot of people when I do my training and, and coaching that we are in the information age. People are prepared to pay for information and, uh, you know, it's great to see some good, hard, solid evidence of that here in Australia. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And it's only going to increase. So I think the e-learning industry is set to double over the next three to four years. Wow. Wow. So what, you know, all this uh, reading and listening you've done, what, what mindset do you think it is that helps you be successful as an entrepreneur? Is there certain attributes to your mindset? Yeah, 100%. I think that the most important attribute that any entrepreneur, or even any successful person needs in this lifetime is the ability to be resilient. Mm. Resilience, you know, I, I say the only reason that I am where I am is that I failed more times than everyone else. That's the only reason. <laughs> isn't that? That's gold, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm here. It's just yeah. that everyone else would have quit quit by now because of, you know, they wouldn't have gotten them, they wouldn't have picked themselves back up. They wouldn't have had another go. They would have quit and gone back to their engineering job. Yeah. And that's, literally the only reason why I'm here is so, because I didn't So who's been your greatest inspiration? Are you inspired by someone in particular to continue to, to, to drive no matter what? Yeah, my brother is a real uh, inspiration. He is um, currently saving the planet. So, he's, you know, he, he's um, awesome. ex uh, corporate comms for people like Mark, uh, Microsoft and AGL and people like that and now is working on ways of, you know, globally impacting the planet and figuring out how to, you know, actually create global climate change. So, um, and just an incredibly smart and compassionate and, um, you know, kind human being. So he really encourages me to be a better human, <clears throat> which I think we all need in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important, isn't it, to be a good person. So you do hear a lot of stories about very driven entrepreneurs not being great with, you know, holding relationships and looking after their friends and family. So, I think it's a good lesson to learn. What, so what, what would you attribute most of your success to then? Uh, I think I am pretty tenacious. <clears throat> so I'm able to just keep going, whereas most people would, yeah, I guess coming back to that resilience thing, most people would quit or they would, um, you know, not have another go. And really that's been something that has tr I have trained myself into. Mm. So it's not something that I was naturally good at. You know, I wasn't born resilient. It was something that I have developed over practicing my mindset and really getting control of my mindset and making sure that um, I'm in alignment with, um, you know, with where I'm, with where I want to go. And really that comes down to 
really diligently um, focusing on the thoughts in your head and your inner critic and really becoming aware of what your inner critic is saying to you each day. Do you, do you have like daily rituals or anything that you do, like meditation or affirmations or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So I do. Um, med- I meditate every single day, and I do a visualization of what I would like to achieve in both um, health, wealth, um, relationships, and love. Yeah, awesome. So it's nice to know. I mean, you, you spoke about being resilient, and you didn't get that, um, you know, on day one. Obviously, it sounds like you've been knocked down a fair few times, which most entrepreneurs have. Do you think that not having a big understanding or a depth of understanding in the money side? in some ways helped you because you, you wouldn't have had a fear of worrying about the money if it wasn't your thing. Correct. Yeah. That is such an interesting way of looking mm. at it. Um, I think about my, my, one of my other brothers who's been thinking about starting a business for, I don't know, about two or three years. He's got a very unique um, skill set that we want to turn into a SAS and he won't bite the bullet and take the plunge because he's very, he needs to know what the money's going to look like. Mm. You know, and I keep saying it, I can't tell you, mate, I, no one can, like we don't, we can't, you know, we can, you know, forecast it, but there's no guarantees that you're going to make this amount of money in this amount of time. So it's funny that, um, yes, I've never cared about the money. And I guess that probably now that you pointed out, interestingly, has probably become an asset. Which is- yeah. Well, just as I'm chatting to you, because a lot of people are stopped by that fear, aren't they? The, the fear of losing their money or not having enough money. And, you know, if you're not great with watching the money or understanding the cash flow side of your business, it can't be something that stops you. And in some ways, I think that could help you. That is so interesting, Ben. Mm. I've never reframed it like that. Mm. I've done a lot of reframing on my money beliefs, but that's an excellent reframe. I'm going to work that in. There you go. As long as you've got great people around you to help you manage it, then let them worry about it. Because um, it's, it's interesting, you know, we had... Uh, I've been to a, a, a couple of workshops and we had a guest speaker at one of my events recently who talks about energy credits and you've only got 100% of energy every day and you've got to decide where you put that energy and once you use your 100 points of energy credits, they're gone. And, you know, if you're worrying about money, if you are a person that worries about money, you could spend a lot. And I, I know people that spend a lot of time worrying about money um, mm. when they could put that energy into maybe producing more sales or, you know, developing a new idea. So, you know, I think I think there is some merit to it. I won't say don't watch your money. <laughs> so I think that's irresponsible. <laughs> but I think there is some merit to your success around that. Yeah, that's so interesting. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. So what, what's your biggest fear then, you know, as you go down this journey of entrepreneurialism? You know, what's the biggest fear for you, Amber? I guess – the biggest fear, which is what I hear a lot of entrepreneurs have, and I was on a coaching call with my Freedom Funnels babes today, um, and and one of them was saying that she was having this fear, and that's the fear that it was all a fluke, mm. and that I'm not going to be able to replicate it, and it was all just a once off, and you know I won't be able to have that success again. So, um, and, and I've heard a lot of really famous entrepreneurs talking about that as well. That at every single level, they're still thinking like, ah, oh, this was just a fluke. It's not going to keep going like this. Um, so, uh, you know, I definitely have those fears and, um, need to, you know, I, I, I tend to just have a very objective and subjective look at what I've achieved so far and, you know, look at my growth and know that, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Like we've done, I've done really well, you know, it's going to mm. be fine we'll tomorrow. Look, and you and that's the thing. I think you've gone down a path now that's quite scientific and scalable. And if you, I, I always say to somebody, if you've created something that you can duplicate and then that duplication has worked, then it's definitely not a fluke, is it? Correct. And also further to that, um, I guess what I've always said to my people are is that I'm, I've am i found one thing that I'm really good at. So I'm really good at evergreen webinar funnels to sell e-courses. I'm really good at that. I have, I've tried everything else in this online marketing game, literally everything else, and I'm not great at anything else. So now I just do this and I duplicate it and I replicate it and I do it day in and day out. And that's where my success has really come from. And I guess that's something that I try to tell all of my students where I see a lot of people being multi-passionate and they've got this business and they're trying to grow this over here. And then they're doing, you know, network marketing and all these other things. There's only enough hours in the day, kind of going back to your energy credits there's only enough hours in the day to be really, really successful and to really master one thing and to get it to the point where it's profitable. And that's what I've done with this business. And I've really finally only understood that with this business. So now I just stick to my lane. I stay at what I'm good at. I replicate it. And and that's where the success and the, the growth has come from. Isn't that a great lesson though? Stick to your lane. I think, um, you know, so many people try and be good at too many things. And then what, what do they say? Um, uh, master of none. What did they say? The, the ex- 
There's a saying. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> some expert of Jack, everything, master Jack of none. All, Jack of all trades, master of none. There you go. You've got a Jack of all trades, master of none. And I think sticking to your lane is is so important. And, and like, it's funny that you say that it's taken you until you've got to this business to work that out. Um, mm-hmm. Would you say that's, you know... The, the, the path you had to go through as an entrepreneur, does it just take time to learn some of these lessons? Or if you had your time over again, would you have changed the way you operated? Oh, look, if I had my time over again, I would have been more conscious of the money from day one, absolutely, mm. rather than sitting in the sand and assuming that it was all going to work out. Um, but, but, you know, it's this is the game. This is the entrepreneurial pathway. I mean, I, I haven't seen any successful entrepreneur not have a very similar pathway to this. So, you know, I think this is just path and parcel of, of being an entrepreneur and um, you know you get better at riding that wave and knowing that some days it's going to be great and the next day you're going to feel like a complete failure and you know that's that's part of the part of the joy of not having to work with someone yeah just something to expect and there's a book by a fellow called Darren Hardy which you may have read called the entrepreneur roller coaster and uh, I mean it talks about that yeah I haven't read it but it, it, it's pretty common We've just told the story that's in that book, I think. So (laughs) I think he wrote that book about you, but that could be said about so many entrepreneurs. Exactly. Perfect. Now, we're just about out of time, Amber, and I'm sure that a lot of the listeners are keen to learn a bit more about some of the courses, particularly, you know, you talk about teaching people how to do the influencer marketing thing. Uh, Can you share sort of somewhere where people could go to learn more? Yeah, absolutely. If you go over to amberna.com, I've got a couple of free classes, which I'll get your link up below, Ben. There's a free class that'll teach you more about the influencer marketing um, uh, program and also just give you some really great education around that. And I've got a great class for uh, funnels as well. It'll teach you basically how to take your uh, idea from idea phase right through to e-course through to funnel phase. So it's a fantastic class. It's got about 105 star reviews. So I'm sure your listeners would really love to check that one out. Wow. And that's free. It's a free free masterclass. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really good. Wow, I just love the the way that um, you know entrepreneurs like yourself are giving a lot of this away now, um, and because it, it does build your community, of course, and builds that trust and relationship. And you're just willing to give now, as where you know in the old days people weren't willing to give. So that's amazing. So go to amberrene.com. Uh, we'll make sure the links are in the show notes. So it's easy for people to find out, and uh, and they'll be able to click on those links. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ben. Really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. It's great that you're uh, able to give that away. Thanks again for coming onto the show. It's been great having you. And I really love uh, your honesty. You know, it's so good uh, to hear about the the journey, warts and all. Yes, it hasn't been an easy one, but it's certainly been fun and definitely a lot more fun than working on a construction site. And I, I can hear you smile over the, uh, over the audio. So it's good to hear that you're still smiling. <laughs> Not too many great hairs either. Fantastic. Well, if you want to get those links, head across to businessbrainfood.com.au. It's episode 225. Or you can just put Amber into the search box and uh, Amber's episode will come up and all the links will be there in the show notes. Now, all we've got left to do, Amber, is the 60-second scramble. I'm going to ask you some quick questions. You're going to give me some quick answers. Are you ready for that? Let's do it. All right. Favourite app on your phone? Evernote. Best way to tune out and relax? Uh, Beach. Do you have a hidden talent? Um, mm, no. <laughs> What's your biggest addiction? Oh, God, red wine. Uh, who's your mentor? Probably my brother, Grant. Yeah, that's lovely. What frightens you the most? Uh, having to get a day job. Describe yourself in one word. Joyful. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, complete the sentence. If I ran the world... Uh, in the world, there would be equality for all. Awesome. Uh, let me see what else. Do you have a favourite inspirational quote you can share? Hmm. It's not a quote, by, but it's from Brene Brown, and she talks about perfectionism is the um, sort of the the a fancy way of dressing up shame and guilt. Yeah, I love it. Well, there's the buzzer. Thanks so much. Uh, I just really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been great chatting with you. Thanks for having me, Ben. Hope your audience gets a lot out of it. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for tuning into the Business Brain Food Podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, head across to your favourite podcast player. Leave an honest review or rating or both, and we love to read them all. We love to get your feedback so we we know that we're uh, still serving you in the best possible way. Today's episode was brought to you by Max My Profit. The team at Max My Profit is growing, and if you think you've got what it takes to be a business accelerator and help business owners build the business they imagined, head across to maximyprofit.com.au, click on the About tab and learn about 
about becoming a business accelerator. All right, well, it's been absolutely fabulous uh, having you listening to the end of the podcast. I've been Ben Futrell, and until next week, have a very profitable day. See ya. Yeah, you could be larger than life.